So this is my mother, the one on the right. <laughs> so my mother graduated from the University of Texas with a degree in English. She then received her master's in library and information science and was a librarian for several years. And after taking a break to raise small children, she returned to the classroom and was a middle school teacher in English, literature, language arts, reading, and Latin for over 20 years. So she was a longtime coach of championship future problem solving teams, an award winning educator to hundreds of students, and can spot a grammatical error on a street sign from about 300 yards. <clears throat> she is an extremely smart woman. She's also absolutely convinced that she has no idea what I do for a living. So the word illiterate or literacy can be used generally, but is most commonly associated with the inability to read or write at an appropriate level. There are millions of people who struggle with illiteracy. There are programs all over the country that offer assistance and training. To have difficulties with illiteracy is a source of discomfort, for, for many a source of shame. It's not information that people volunteer. Innumeracy, on the other hand, is a different story. And today, I'm applying innumeracy more broadly to difficulties with mathematics or statistics or any of these related topics. So that's not a word that is commonly used, but it's more readily self-identified. So we hear, oh, I am not a math person. So Paul Ernest at, uh, from Exeter University, this is a philosopher in mathematics who focuses on social constructivism, um, which is the theory of how human development and knowledge acquisition come from social interaction with others. And he has the following quote, a widespread public image of mathematics is that it is difficult, cold, abstract, theoretical, ultra-rational, but important and largely masculine. It also has the image of being remote and inaccessible to all but a few super intelligent beings with mathematical minds. In contrast to the shame associated with illiteracy, enumeracy is almost a matter of pride amongst educated persons in Western Anglophone countries. And then from my personal experience, it seems like every person I sit next to on an airplane has a story to tell about how terrible they are at statistics and how they cheated on all of their exams in college. So, to be illiterate is a problem, and to be enumerate is, is what? Is cool? Well, is enumeracy actually a problem? Yes, the answer is yes. Every few years, the results of the latest National Adult Illiteracy and Enumeracy Survey get released, and there's a frenzy of articles trumpeting and sounding the call to devote more substantial resources to enumeracy, which includes educating people about how terrible this is and the importance of this issue. Yeah, this is not so much helping the cause, yeah? So can you imagine Mattel creating a Barbie that giggled as she said, oh, I can't read, right? That's just not gonna happen, <laughs> yeah? But this is somehow okay, all right? Oddly, this is not really helping our cause either in a different way. So the characters from the popular TV show, The Big Bang Theory, are gifted in mathematics and physics, and they're portrayed as kind of these lovable, quirky nerds. And we laugh at their interactions and how they solve problems. But for many people in the country, this is what a mathematician looks like. And so some of us are laughing with them, but many people are laughing at them. So this, this is not helping either. Our other option is this. We see the computer genius creepily surrounded by computers, staring at all of the data, searching, searching, possibly stalking, searching for information <laughs> until they find that one significant piece. And that's the character that often saves the day, but that is not a man you would take home to dinner, yes? <laughs> so what I'm going to push back on a little bit today and claim is that our issue is really about the self-perception of enumeracy. So how you feel about your ability to do math and statistics. Because research has shown that there is no type of math person. And that when we self-assess our skills, it's often done in relative comparison to other skills. So for example, if I'm strong in rhetoric or language acquisition, I automatically downgrade my skills in math, regardless of what they are, and vice versa. If I'm good at mathematics and statistics, then I might assess my writing skills as being less than they really are. So who are you? Are you Teen Talk Barbie? 
Are you a lovable physics nerd? Or are you this guy? Yeah? <laughs> and that's what everybody is always self-assessing who they are. And in actuality, you're not who you think. We, we all have slightly incorrect perceptions of our skills. So let's, let's get back to my mom here for a second. While I would be a little cautious in saying this directly to her face, my mother is wrong. So my mother understands mathematics. She understands probability. She understands statistics. She understands all of these things. She does them every single day as she's making decisions throughout her life. For example, when she goes to cross the street, yes, she is standing there. She looks both ways, and perhaps she sees a car coming. And as that car is coming, she's building a probabilistic model in her head of, can I walk into the street right now? As the car changes direction, slows down, speeds up, makes different decisions, she is constantly updating the probability of what's going to happen next. And at some point, she optimizes, she makes a decision, and she steps into the street. Doesn't get hit by the car. It's probability and statistics at its best. Another thing that we commonly do all the time, if we're walking down the hall or we're walking in a crowded area, we continually assess the space around us, we predict whether or not we're going to run into somebody, and then we make kind of a probabilistic decision of, is that person going to move this way? I'll move this way. And you're constantly adjusting as you move. And when two people both move to the same spot, there's kind of a, oh, sorry, and kind of a laugh because you know you've guessed wrong somehow. You update your model, and then you fix it, and you move back to the other side. These are complicated statistical processes we do. We also make decisions like, do we need a coat today? Do we think it's going to rain? These are nonstop probability and statistical modeling decisions we are making all the time. So if I'm having this conversation with my mom, let's look at something that might be kind of more in her, in her wheelhouse. So this is a poem, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost, and this is an example of a type of annotation assignment that you might see in an English class or a writing class, et cetera. This is the stuff my mom excels at. So there are a couple of ways that we could think about this assignment or this, this piece of analysis. The first is I could just think about analyzing the theme, right, the words in the actual poem. And when I'm looking at that, I might think, all right, I see the word yellow. Does that mean that it's autumn? I'm going to start looking for other words that match that potential theme. I start looking for things like, do I see more positive words? Do I see more negative words? Do I see questioning? Do I see repetition of words? All of this is data that is being processed and helping you build a model toward what is the actual theme here? What is happening inside this poem? How am I going to interpret it? These are all variables that have, you've been keeping track of the entire time. That's one way to look at this assignment. Another way might be how to actually teach students how to annotate. So how to find sort of strategies that contribute to better learning outcomes. And I mean things as simple like, where did you write on the page? Did you write close to the words? Did you write far away from the words? Did you underline everything? Was everything important? Which words did you circle? What time of day or night did you actually do these annotations? All of this is information that can contribute to how a student is learning this poem or learning the skills that we're trying to teach with this poem. So how I might handle that problem is all of this data that's being collected, I might input as variables into a spreadsheet. I could build a kind of a complicated prediction model using some statistical software package. It might take me weeks to do correctly. My mom, the English teacher, does this in her head. She just reads what the students are writing, thinks about all of those data and the variables, and creates a prediction model for how the student is learning. Which features might be more important for her to teach the next day in order to improve their chances of learning? So she's doing this all of the time. She's not thinking of it as doing statistics or data analysis, but she's doing this all the time. As are the rest of us, the amount of data that we process, analyze, model, collect, et cetera, every day is staggering. So by one set of estimates from UC San Diego, it's up to around something like 16 hard drives worth of information for each person each day. That's unbelievable. So how can people 
who process, analyze, model, collect, et cetera, that much data every single day and also make fairly rational choices all day long based on probabilities, how could they possibly think of themselves as not math people? Yeah? So what is going on here? And, and why am I choosing to talk about this right now? Why do I think this is more important to be considering right now? The explosion of data science, all right? So data science as a field is ubiquitous now. There's constant press coverage and interest from students, from industries, from parents who incessantly ask me, will my children have a job when they graduate? Data science is one of the hot buzzwords right now. So let's take a look at what's happening in terms of an education standpoint with programs. Um, so we have 49 bachelor's degrees right now. That includes minors, so that's majors and minors. We have 93 certificates, and a certificate could be viewed as kind of a supplementary thing, so you're majoring in one, and then you have a supplementary certificate. There are 19 doctoral degrees, and there are almost 400 master's degrees in data science. And these are um, in departments like statistics, information systems, um, business, machine learning, computer science. Many of these data science degrees are interdisciplinary across several departments. This is amazing. This isn't like the last 10, 15 years. This is an incredible number of degrees and programs. And with respect to the data scientist, it is a sought after job. It is considered a top job to have in America, and there are lots of opportunities. But what actually is data science? So here's one graph. Here's one proposed uh, kind of picture of data science. We have math, stats, and algorithms on the top. We have software engineering on the left, data communication on the right. This is a Venn diagram. So as the circles overlap, those areas are people who have all the O skills from the overlapping circles. And you notice that data scientist is in the middle. So a data scientist is someone who theoretically has math stats, software engineering, and data communication. You might notice that the intersection between software engineering and data communication is empty. And I, you can make of that what you will. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> I, personally, I personally like uh, this graphic a little bit better. There we go. This graphic, we have computer science, <laughs> we have math and statistics, and importantly, we have subject matter expertise. I'll come back to that. And having all of those is the mythical unicorn, yes? So what I take from this graphic is it's very complicated to think of what a perfect data scientist is. So what is somebody who has all of these skills? In some sense, it's very flexible and interdisciplinary. And to be able to find someone who has all of these skills and call them a data scientist is, is probably unreasonable. My concern is, is that at, as data science is exploding, in order to keep up or compete, the number of programs has been proliferating. So universities are starting data science programs to attract students, to help them give them the skills they're going to need for industry. But at a national level, the conversation is centering more on what are the foundations of data science. So how do we understand and, um, how do we understand and define data science as a discipline? So, for example, the National Science Foundation and the National Academy of Sciences have recently devoted a non-trivial amount of financial and manpower resources to, to this topic. And as a result, we, have, we, might, we can build the programs, but will the people actually come to them? Who, who's going to join these programs? Who's going to think, yes, that's for me, and who's going to think, oh, I'm going to opt out of that? And my concern is, is that this is going to lead to a stronger bifurcation of programs and people, so people who do data science and people who do not do data science. And that decision will be made based on some self-perception of skills that's inaccurate. So for example, everybody does, everybody crosses the street, everybody builds a probabilistic model and get getting through their day in some sense. Okay, so everybody is able to communicate and talk to people working in data science. They do this all of the time. Now, lest you think that I am letting the people who think they're good at math and statistics, et cetera, off the hook, no. If you do not understand how people think and write and create and behave, 
then you are also part of the problem. It is going to be necessary for these disciplines to communicate with each other. So I'm not advocating, for example, that everyone take a data science course or that everyone be in data science. I'm advocating for collaboration and communication across the disciplines. I'm advocating for everyone in this entire room to think about your skill sets and what kind of person you think you are and really take a hard look at that because you probably know more than you think you do. And you can communicate with these areas in a stronger way than you probably believe you can. And when you come to several roads diverging, we want you to be able to see yourself on several paths and not be forced to take one of them. So, coming back to my mom, the woman on the left, she has an undergraduate degree in math and statistics. She has multiple graduate degrees in statistics. She works in statistics. She spends a lot of time on a computer. She is a data scientist. The woman on the right, she has degrees in English, literature, speaks Latin. She analyzes text, teaches people how to write, teaches people how to read critically. She is also a data scientist. You are all data scientists, and imagine what we could accomplish together. Thank you. <laughs>